It's good to welcome everyone here. My name is Aaron Kohler. I'm a professor of Near Eastern Studies at Yeshiva University in New York and a senior fellow at the Oxford Interfaith Forum. And it's a real honor to welcome you to the program we have this afternoon, this evening, this morning, if you're farther west. Uh, it's going to be a split program uh, reflecting the bilingual nature of the book that we're celebrating. And we're celebrating the publication of a book of Hebrew English poetry by Admiel Kosman. And so our first conversation will feature the author. Admiel is professor of Talmud at Potsdam University and the academic director of the Abraham Geiger Reform Rabbinical Seminary in Berlin. He's published nine books of Hebrew poetry. Um, and now this is his second bilingual Hebrew English collection. He's also published six academic books on his field of research of Talmud and Midrash. Um, I won't read uh, the full list of all of the many things that he's accomplished and done in his life, but I will say that he's been awarded the Israel National Prize for Poetry, a uh, number of Israel National Prizes for Poetry, including the Bernstein Prize, the Prime Minister's Prize, and the B Brenner Prize, uh, which is particularly important because it's awarded by the Hebrew Writers Association in Israel. Dr. Tamar Hess is chair of the Department of Hebrew Literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and head of the Rivivim Honors Program for training teachers in Jewish studies. She teaches modern Hebrew literature. She will be in conversation with Professor Kozma. Thanks um, uh, for hosting us um, at this uh, event celebrating uh, this exquisite collection um, of uh, Admiel Kosman's um, uh, poems that uh, Lisa Katz has uh, edited, chosen, and translated, and given us a double gift because um, um, on, on, for, for Hebrew readers, it's, an, it's uh, a fabulous collection of Kosman's poems. It's uh, a retrospective from his early poetry to, uh, to the most uh, recent, choosing from every, every selection. And it gives us a, a, a profile of, um, of Kosman that hasn't been seen in Hebrew this, uh, this way. And uh, and then of course the poems come alive in uh, in English and they're uh, uh, you'll be speaking later about how they're an interpretation of uh, uh, of Kosman's uh, poetry uh, as well. So as as a Hebrew reader, I understood the poems differently reading them through uh, the translations that you've given us. So thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Admiel, for the, these great collections. Why don't we start by reading a poem and then talking about? So the first the first poem that I'd like for us to read is. Uh, the Central God, Elohim Amil Kazi in Hebrew. I'll share my screen and uh, so everyone can follow when you read it in Hebrew, and then Lisa will read it in um, in English. As you read. Okay. Elohim Amil Kazi. The Elohim Amil Kazi, Asher over Achshav Etzlenu Bashuna. A kolu merape o metaken, Vieslo Zman Beshefa. Ishkwalo nithak, et mol. היום, מחר, הוא מחייך. עכשיו הוא האלוהים המרכזי הבא בתור זגג. זגג. זגג חדש לתיקונים. מכל מרפסת ומרפסת, כל בני המשפחה והשכנים, כולם רואים אותו עכשיו. כזה רזה ודק, כמעט שקוף. עובר בנינוחות גמורה, מתקין ומסדר. הו, אין לך מה לדאוג, גברת. הכל מבריק עכשיו. החלונות והאורות, הכל חדש ומצוחצח. כך הדבר של החיים הולך ומסתדר. כשאלוהים המרכזי שלי עובר עכשיו בתור זגג אצלנו בשכונה. זה אלוהים המרכזי, זה העליון, זה המרומם, והוא עובר עכשיו אצלנו בשכונה בתור גנן. עם מגרפה ועט ודלי אחד שבור, הוא מנקש והוא עודר על הגינה של השכנים משמאל ומפזר אבק נצחי של זוהר על המחווה של העתיד, של העבר מה יש כאן לפחד ומחייך אל הזקן והזקנה אין שום דבר לא מאוחר אין לי עצה ולי תבונה ולי שליחה, לי הבנה ושוב חוזר האל ומחייך זה אלוהים המרכזי של הכבוד, הערפל המלאכים והשכינה, לאנשים שלי העייפים כל כך שבשכונה, אתמול, היום, מחר, זה אלוהים המרכזי, זה העליון, זה המרומם, זה הניסה, 
עובר עכשיו אצלנו בשכונה עם מריצה. זה אלוהים המקצועי, טייח, תפשן בחסד, וגם סייד השפע, על המריצה בין הגלילים לעריכים, עוד מטלטל לו לא לוח גבס הידיעה והבחירה, בעוד האל הזה, כזה רזה, האל המרכזי, האל המשפץ, אשר ייסד לפני שנים רבות את היקום הזה, טהור וזך, יושב קרובים, גיבור וצח, אדון, בורא, יוצר ומישרים כל עוד עובר, עוטה כדוק גלימת אורה. האל הזה עובר עכשיו אצלי בנינוחות גמורה, מתקין, יפה ומסדר את מה שבא בעבירה. Our Anglophone listeners, Lisa, could you read the English now? The central God is passing through our neighborhood now. He heals everyone, fixes everything, and he has plenty of time. No one will be pushed aside. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, he smiles. He's the central God in the role of a glazier now. A glazier, a new glazier for repairs. And from every porch, all the families and neighbors watch him now. So tall and slim, almost transparent, passing through, he repairs everything in complete serenity. Oh, you've nothing to worry about, ma'am. Everything's shining now, the windows and the lights, all scrubbed like new. This is how life improves, as my central God passes by now as a glazier in our neighborhood. He is the central God, supreme, the one on high. And now he's passing through our neighborhood as a gardener with a rake and a broken bucket. He weeds and hoes, sprinkles bright eternal dust on the lawn of the neighbor to the left and on the burn wound of the future and the past. There's nothing to be afraid of here. He's smiling at the old man and woman. It's never too late. I have wisdom and counsel and I have forgiveness and understanding and again, The God returns and smiles, the central God of dignity, of mist, the angels and divinity of my people so weary in the neighborhood yesterday, today, tomorrow. He is the central God, supreme, the one on high, the lofty one, passing through our neighborhood with a wheelbarrow now. He's the professional God, a plasterer, an excellent steeplejack, and also a provider of whitewash in abundance. The plaster tablets of free will and divine knowledge totter in his wheelbarrow among the cylinders and tiles. While this God so slim, the central God, Mr. Fix-It, who established this pure and clean universe many years ago, sits with Cherubim now, a pure hero, Lord, creator, and speaker of the plain truth, wrapped in a filmy robe of light. This God passes near me in complete serenity now, a good maker fixing every transgression he meets. Admiel, I, I want to ask you, I know you don't necessarily agree with me on this, but um, uh, in um, Israeli, in the history of Israeli poets, you, you signify a revolution in um, uh, the joining of um, um, religious poets to Israeli poetry that had been secularized for For generations before you opened the door for uh, secular for, for religious Israeli poetry joining the tradition of secularized poetry and in this poem specifically um your God is a very mundane figure but he has bright eternal dust that he spreads on everything and um I want, I want to I want you to, we, we spoke before and if you could tell us more about the your your concept of the Um, a um, um, of the relationship between religious texts and your religious background and writing Hebrew and Israeli poetry. I'll say only a few words that are not really covering the deep, large issue that you are talking about. First of all, you are referring here to the connection between art, uh, creative human, Uh, or culture in general, what we call literature, music, whatever, to the religious level. This is an issue for itself that uh, demands not, not one semester, I always say, at least two semesters, with good students. 
So, uh, and to myself as well, to study with them. It's not an easy thing, but one thing I can say, the, the common dominator that is, as I feel it all my life, is that you are not living uh, in the religion, you are, you are living in religiosity, as Buber would say, in his language. And I mentioned Buber a lot, not because it, with everything that Buber said, I, I agree, but it's easier to speak about somebody and to hang, as we say in Hebrew, to speak through the language of somebody who expressed much of what I'm saying. Not everything, again, is exactly what I try to say, but it's easier to say Buber wrote, then it's a kind of path that I'm putting in front of us. It's not religion that I was interested for my childhood, although I was grown up as, you know, in Israel it would be called orthodoxy. Uh, some of will call it Tionudati, uh, uh, the religious Zionism. Some would call it modern. In America, they would call it mo modern orthodox. But, uh, and was educated in the best schools that you can imagine in Israel in this path. But I never felt one of it. Actually, I never felt one of anybody. And the, the, the same thing is about the academia that I'm living in the academia. The same thing is about every institution that I see. I never was really belonging to anything and felt always outsider when I was there. And in the end, either I went away or they banished me because it was too much for them. So it's, it's a type of things that let you in the end, a situation that led you in the end not to be one of anything and to see the things in a kind of exile all the time. And that makes you um, more, it's not really, I cannot say that it is a rule, but it, it, it let the spirit, as Buber say, again, I'm saying the Buber thing, to to, to let the spirit, if you are intent to be with God and to live with true religious reality, not not religion, but religi religiosity, then you can find yourself in the end in a kind of a, of creative religious life. And the poems, for me, are discussion in the end with God in this way or the other. Even if they are erotic poems, they are speaking about the, the the huge gift of giving us this erotic energy. So it's always a kind of speech, not speak, dialogue with God. It's a, it's a kind of discussion. This is not a, what you find not in the secular poems in Israel as they are, and not in what is called now religious um, movement of, of creative uh, poems in Israel because they don't have it. They are one, they are belonging to the institution and that was in my eyes blocking them. But again, it's, I said only points that are like chapters for, for a book to be written. <laughs> Not more, I cannot enter into the points in really in depth. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. No, uh, it's, it's, you've opened, opened a lot of room for thoughts. Um, I want to ask about one of those um, um, sub chapters, possibly um, the uh, the language in the poem that we've uh, read of this mundane uh, God walking around and uh, working in favor of everyone is it's the poem is embedded with uh, lang with um, uh, if 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 you you were talking about in, being in dialogue with so this is in dialogue with many Jewish texts um, that. Um, uh, that are in, in the poem of, of prayer as, and, and of uh, biblical language. Um, what, what texts do you feel you are most in conversation with? First of all, I, I have to say what I told you already, Tamar, when we spoke uh, in the pre preparation discussion, that I, I, it's true, I know people will, will maybe, don't, wouldn't believe me, but that's the truth. I never wrote any poem. This is the real through sheer truth that I cannot prove, but that's the fact. I, I ne was never belonging to any group of writers. I was not part of any, any you know, uh, uh, periodical that uh, published. I still have problems to, to print in Israel and outside things. Uh, this is not, 
the easy part of my life. I never was part of any 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 group. Actually, I never had friends. This, although I'm connected to to hundreds of people via connection via connections in the academia or other things, but the institution that is called friendship, I never I I was not never I was never interested in it even as a child. And of course, you can understand that to be grown up like that in a very, very tight society like Israel and the army later is not the easiest thing. Uh, in the yeshiva, academia, I learned in many yeshivot before I came to the academia is not uh, an easy thing, but but I couldn't behave differently. That's That's what I was born into something else. So what what I'm saying is that that uh, the language I, since I never wrote any any poem or what what to make it simple what what does it mean that means that only when the poem comes I write it I'm the messenger I'm the pizza deliverer I always say I'm not the one even to prepare the pizza so I'm I'm just the uh, the messenger on my bicycle to bring it to the people I don't feel that it is me. Even now that we are speaking, it sounds to me when we read it as somebody else wrote it. I tell you the truth. So I never know from where it comes and why it comes. I know that I don't have to wish that it will come. It's not my business. I'm only the messenger. So if it comes, I write it. Sometimes it comes to me that I have to fix something that was written because many, many things are only... the beginning of something but then I hear the call and I come sometimes to the computer sometimes to the paper to make my to 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 make my to to feel to feel my job and that's all to feel up what I'm 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 <laughs> standard to do but not more than that when I'm enjoying something from that I enjoy it as you enjoy it not really enjoyment that's not the right thing I would say that if a poem is really making me feel that it has to be sent then I know that this is a poem otherwise I don't know that this is a poem but this feeling is very strong I cannot even imagine I think that it is much stronger than anything that I feel in my life in every sense I mean um we we all are having you know kind of uh, excitement for many things in life but i think that this is different from any anything that i know of now even academically i'm not writing something that is not coming to me as like falling down from above and because i don't have now to run away after getting my uh my uh, you know full professorship uh, thank god and i i'm not in a in a run and uh, competition with anybody so i'm writing only things that are falling in like to then i'm the messenger again i have to work a lot in order to write it and mostly it is not accepted because it's not the regular things that people are writing in the academia it's falling down somewhere always but anyhow the I, w- I wish to live like that all my life, even in other senses, in the relationship with people, with my children, my family, my, my neighbors, everywhere. I feel that this is the right way to live. Not, I am not able to do it. But here in poetry, it is clear cut. It's coming and you know that it is coming. And even now, I'm not running after that. Uh, in, in the few last days, I had a poem that fell. Just from above, I don't know how I write it here in this place that I'm sitting now on a paper and then writing it in the computer. That's all but but again to to the point that you are asking, it's very, very, very deep thing, the language. The language is a mix of everything. Like you cannot control your dreams if I have to make an example. The dreams are wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, I mean the way the the way they they create themselves the dreams is example for poetry you are not involved in that but you see the beauty of it if you write it after you are waking up whether it is a, a, a pleasure event or or a horror event it's it's a masterpiece if you follow the power of creating dreams the same thing is about it you know when the ego is there and you want to write it Or it is come as pure as a dream is coming. And then you you can see 
that you don't understand it. Now, the language is the most, I mean, uh, the, the most hardest part to understand, how the language is, is creating this kind of carpet for materials that are, in this point, for example, you have the street language of the people in Israel, you have the you have the 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 poems that you find in the Siddur, in the prayer book, you have language from all over the world and they are wooed in a, like in a carpet in a wonderful way and you don't understand how. You can understand it better than me as somebody who is expert in analyzing poems or Adriana later can speak about it. But I don't understand it at all. Okay. I, I want us to look at a very different poem, uh, since we, you're talking about this weave of carpets, just so that everyone can get a, a, um, an impression of the, the great variety of voices and languages that um, this uh, this book and you are offering us. And uh, I want us to look at a poem that's um, uh, really uh, dreamlike and um, uh, and also um, speaks to what you were saying about poems being sort of, sort of a revelation and dreamlike. So um, I'll share my screen again. מעל גגות הכפר היהודי. אני ואהובתי הדמיונית מרחפים מעל גגות הכפר היהודי. מעל החצרות, הרפתות והדירים. מעל הגגונים המשופעים של הלולים. ריחות וקרקורים, אוויר וקור ורוח מטרפים את שערה הדמיוני, הרך הצבעוני, הנע כמו קלפים. אהובתי גויה היא, בת קרקים היא, מתל אביב העיר היא, ומצחקקת, צחוק נעים ומשוחרר. וגם אצלי שבין הכפר אני, בהיותי בריחופי, כבר נעלמו וחלפו שערי העקבות, הגמגומים, ההסמקות, ודיבורי קולח ושוטף. אנחנו מתנשקים, מהר, באמצע, באוויר, בלי הפסקות. ידיי, זקני ערך, שתי פאותיי, וכובעי ושתי רגליי, נעים מולה למעלה, בשמיים, תלתאות רבות לאין מספר. חום הגופות יוצר ענן לבן בהיר קולח, מעל גבלון ההר, הפחונים העצובים וקוביות הכפר. אנחנו מתחבקים אפוא למעלה, במרכז, בתכלת, באמצע השמיים התכולים, בדיוק מעל הכנסייה, מעל הצלב. וכל הכפר היהודי שלי בוהה, מביט, וכמו עשרות עיניים ננעצות אצלי בגב. אך אנו בשלנו, מגביהים, נעלמים בעננים גבוה, כה גבוה, בנשיקה שמימית, קרובים לאלוהים. הוי, חץ כאב אהובתי, אהובתי הדמיונית הנוכרייה, המפ... המפלח את הכפר שבליבי כמו ירייה. בנשיקה עזה מאוד, בנשיקה שמימית, וכל השאר, כלומר, כל החיים שאחר כך בכפר, הרי הם משולים לפצע, פצע הנגרר איתי שנים. וכמו תצריב כזה יפה של בן עקוד נפול פנים שביצירת אמן, או כמו חתך המחרשה המדמם עצבות על פני תלמי הזמן. I and my imaginary lover hover above the roofs of the Jewish village, above the courtyards, dairy barns, animal pens, above the slanting roofs of the chicken coops, amid smells and clucking, cold air and wind, must her imaginary hair, soft, colorful, flapping like cards. My love is not Jewish. She's an urban girl from the city of Tel Aviv, giggling a pleasant and liberating laugh. I'm an inhibited village boy, and as I hover, the stammering and the rest of my blushes have completely disappeared. My voice is eloquent. We kiss quickly in the middle of the air without stopping. My hands, my tender beard, my earlocks, my hat, and my two feet moving near her up there in the skies like so many uncountable lizards. The heat of our bodies creates a white cloud, pale and streaming above humpback mountains, sorry tin shacks and village cubes. And so we embrace up there in the center, in the blue, in the middle of the blue sky, right above the church, above the cross. 
and the entire Jewish village stares, watches like dozens of eyes stabbing my back. But we are into our thing, rising, disappearing into the clouds, high, so high, in a heavenly ki kiss close to God. Oy, a painful arrow, my love, my imaginary non-Jewish love, cleaves the village in my heart like a gunshot with a very daring heavenly kiss and all the rest. That is to say, all of life that comes after in the village is an allegory about a wound, a wound I've dragged along with me for years, like this lovely etching of a sacrificed child face fallen by an artist or like the slash of a plow bleeding sorrow on top of the furrows of time. Um, and yet, um, I, I told you this poem reminds me of a, a Chagall painting. It's like uh, putting, putting a Chagall. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we're in a dream of an Eastern European fantasy moved to Tel Aviv and to Israel. And um, there's, um, with the pleasure of of, uh, of the scene, there's a lot of humor in uh, your your poems um, um, a, a, as well. It connects with, when you're dealing with very serene issues. Um, the, um, it, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you make these things funny? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, as I told you, because I'm not writing them, but I'm always laughing from from when I read them, I don't know from where it comes, because there, there, I can again, I can I can have with my students a course on humor in Jewish text. Like the Talmud is full of humor. The Jewish, the Jewish people at least are very famous for having maybe because of the, you know, uh, all the suffering that is accompanies the Jewish life as a community. It was like a, a kind of therapy, inner therapy of of the community. And but I never had it in my in at my home. It was a very very serious uh, family. I my mother I, I I don't remember my mother never laughed or my father or or anybody around me when I, at least in my memory. So I don't know from where it comes. It comes from the poems. I guess that the pizza had it from itself. I don't know why God is sending it like that. I have no idea. We have this poem has the community. Um, the first poem uh, that we read describes God to the community. Uh, the second one that we read has a very hostile community um, stabbing the individual uh, speaker. And because we're running short of time, we're going to conclude with a poem which you directly address, or the speaker in the poem directly addresses um, God. Um, and con it's a very confrontational poem as, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as well. As I told you, Tamar, I think that these poems again. I'm not, I'm not authority, authority in in this kind of things. You are much more than me, as somebody who who can analyze text and teach text and and understand the text. But but at least my impression is this kind of poem that I'm not I'm reading with you is talking about the god of the religion, the god of the of the of what I don't think that I can believe even if I would be forced to believe and I never believed even as a child I never believed even when I learned in the yeshiva so this is a rejection to what is the religion not the religiosity that was in me all the time so uh, let me read it oh, wait wait let, let me put it on um, um okay. on the screen okay. for everyone okay. um the Jewish Prometheus כמו פרומטאוס היהודי, כמו פרומטאוס היהודי בשקט מגשש. אני, ראשון היהודים, עולה אל המגדל, גונב ממך את האש. וגם בהזדמנות הזאת, תסלח לי, איזה בדל, סיגריה האחרונה, מכיס הרקיעים המרשרש. אם לא אתה, קונה הכל, מצוי כזה, שלם, נבדל, אני לבד אשפוך על השמיים בין ארבעים צבע מדולדל וגם אזמין את האורבים שלך לבוא לשבת לי על העצים האלה ולעשות לך סקנדל. Thank you. Lisa. Okay. Like the Jewish Prometheus, I feel my way quietly. I, first of the Jews, climb the tower and steal your fire. And at the same opportunity, sorry, I steal a butt. a last cigarette from the crinkly pocket of heaven. 
If you don't, owner of everything, so real, perfect, discreet, I myself will splash paint over the sky at sunset, and I'll call to your ravens to sit with me in these trees and create a scandal for you. Thank you. Thank you both. We, we have to end our part here. Um, yeah. I, I would have loved to ask about what happened to the scandal in Hebrew when it turned into a scandal. Uh, but maybe we'll, we'll leave that um, for later. That's a perfect uh, segue to the question of translation. So mm -hmm, I think right. that's actually a perfect note to end uh, this segment on. And on that note, thank you, Tamar and Admiel. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our next two guests, but very quickly because I do want to give them time to speak rather than to hear their bios. Um, so we have Dr. Lisa Katz, who's a translator and a poet who lives in Jerusalem and who, whose voice you've already heard. Um, she's published two collections of her own poems and several volumes of Hebrew poetry that she's translated. Uh, one of her co-translated volumes was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award a few years ago. Um, and uh, Adriana X. Jacobs is a poet, scholar, and translator based in Oxford in New York City. She's an associate professor at the University of Oxford. She's also published a number of, of very impressive volumes, uh, translations of Hebrew poetry, um, which have won numerous awards. And she's been awarded a number of grants and fellowships for the translation work. And also uh, is the author of Strange Cocktail, Translation and the Making of Modern Hebrew Poetry, uh, in 2018, which was a finalist for the Jordan Schnitzer Book Award um, from the uh, Association of Jewish Studies. So there's lots that uh, I would love to hear from these two wonderful scholars and guests. So I'll turn it over to them and uh, to the second half of the conversation. And let me just say, I don't know if we'll have time for questions, but um, we will keep them to the to the chat. So if there are questions as, as they percolate in your head, please send them in the chat, ideally straight to me. Um, and I'll hopefully have a few minutes at the end to just curate some questions for the author, the translators, or any of our guests. All right, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start off uh, asking Lisa some questions about the translation, the experience of translating, and hopefully if we have time to get into some of the poems and more specific questions about the translation process. So. I want to start um, just first of all, congratulating you, Lisa, on this undertaking. Um, it's a really wonderful uh, collection of poems, um, really wonderful translations. Um, and it's also your second full length translation of Kosman's poetry. And it arrives almost 12 years or so after your first translation of his work, Approaching You in English, which was also published by Zephyr Press. And while that, book drew from nine collections. Uh, they were rearranged by you to create a collection that doesn't exist in Hebrew. This one, on the other hand, also draws from multiple collections, but is organized chronologically. So I kind of want to have pitch, pitch two questions to you. Uh, the first is, what is it about Kosman's poetry that has motivated you to keep translating it? And two, beyond the obvious temporal differences, how does a chronological approach uh, differ ultimately and fundamentally from the one you used previously? I, what I want to say, I think that what Admiral just defined as religiosity is just human and has nothing to do with organized religion. And as a completely secular, all my life secular to this day, even though I've been in Israel for 40 years, I have really no collection, no connection to the text that, he's, that he is using, which he wouldn't actually reveal too much about in the answers to Tamar's question. <laughs> um, and I think that, I was gonna say, I think I secularized him in translation, but I actually think it, 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 isn't, it isn't religious poetry. It's poetry that moves me. And I, and I thought about why I like poetry. And when I was a child, we were given in school, we, had, we were each given a poem, a different poem, we had to recite them. And ever since then, I've really liked poetry. And I, I, I think it was a physical thing. And it's hard for me to separate the physical from the mental and the spiritual. I don't even know what that is. All I have is a body. And there's a lot of body in Admiral Kosman's poetry. A lot of it. And while I, in 1999, I was assigned to translate him for an international poetry festival, which they stopped having in 2006 in Jerusalem. 
and ever and then I just wanted to translate more and I, I maybe even gave me books uh, I don't remember and then um, it, it gave me lists because I, my Hebrew is not my Hebrew um, it it isn't perfect at all but I can write English really well so after I talk to someone about something I can get it into English and what I, I mean I think I just um, it's poetry for me it's poetry that's why I think it needed to be in English and it was good that it's in English so people can read it. It's a, which now when you hear Admiel, and I've heard him say this before, he used to say that the poems jump up at him. <laughs> so um, I, I think that, um, that that's true, he's a poet. Okay, he's a scholar, but, but he's a poet. And that has to do with writing things that move people that come from unknown spaces that we don't exactly know what they mean. I don't know what, I don't know what he means. When I, a lot of times when I translate, I don't know what he means. I can look up things and find out, or he can tell me where to read or, or he sends it to me, you know, something in the Talmud that I can read it. And then I begin to understand, or he explains it to me. Um, but it's just, for me, it's poetry. You, you reviewed the first book that i um, approaching you in English. <laughs> and you said, but it's not a, it's not a book. It's not a translation of a book. It's a, it's a collection. It's something new in Hebrew. The first book I picked, what was attractive that I thought would make people read. They would want to read the first poem in the first book is about writing poetry. What I can do, I can write poems. I thought that was great anyway. And, um, and then I just, I wanted people to keep reading. So it's like greatest hits. But since you said that, and I take you really seriously, I decided that this book, it should be in chronological order. From the beginning, when he writes about the army, he's writing about a problem with the army. <laughs> and a problem, um, I actually wanted to look at um, uh, letters from reserve duty, which he apparently wrote in his 20s, which to me, it could somebody could write it right now, which questions the connection to the land and what it means. And then reminds us, looking overhead, and now we have drones. I don't think we had drones then, that what you are uh, shooting at has children in the house. It's, it's incredible to me. It's so completely relevant. And I don't think he wrote, I'm sure he didn't write it to be relevant, but it is. And it speaks to me. See, I don't remember if I necessarily meant my observation to be a critique, more just that's that okay. It's okay. when we do, when we rearrange, we are creating a book that doesn't exist to the original, but it's always a book that doesn't exist in the original. Um, but then it, when a reader is, is told that there's a chronological approach, they might start to think in terms of like development and evolution and other things. So it just creates, I think, interesting and different no, reading. I, I think it was a really good thing to say. It made me aware of what I was doing. So I was really glad that you said it. Um, but I just think it's so fascinating that you did do it differently this time because now it's like I, I want to go back to see if it changes somehow the way I, I read these two books together. But since you did mention um, the letters from reserve duty, that segues nicely into the next question, or which is um, both a question, sort of a comment. Um, and this is something you and I keep talking about, uh, have had ongoing conversations about, which is that you know, often there's this expectation that translators are decoders, linguistically and cultural decoders, that we unlock the mystery and meaning of an original poem so that then the translation becomes this kind of gloss or exegesis on the original poem. Mm -hmm. um, and with this in mind, I wanna to turn to letters from reserve duty um, in the South of Israel, which appears on pages 15 and 17 in this book. Um, and I'll share the screen. I'll just, I was wondering if you would just read the first one Letters from reserve duty in the south of Israel, in the guard tower. When I arrived, I knew a great man had been there before me. There were signs on the ground, traces of a struggle and shouts and black soot covering the stone, the site of an ancient ritual. Perhaps Abraham of Beersheba or Isaac waiting for Rebecca, or perhaps Jacob on his way from Haran, I don't know but there were signs of it at the distant army base. Ponderously, he made his way north to the mountains with women and children and sheep. And now too, it's a fact, the ground under me struggles to hold on to these footsteps and the tattoo that's been on the door all these years that no one has managed to erase. 
when we were emailing about this uh, event, you described these two poems as an example of translating what is said, not what is meant. And I was really intrigued by this formulation and was hoping you could say a bit more about this. Every translator has to do that in a way because we don't, the meaning comes from the reader and the, I, I am obviously translating meaning and giving meaning to ascribing meaning. Adriana, with right. a small note, the fact is that many people tried to, to, to translate the poems and it did not work. There is a miracle with Lisa that we both don't understand, but it it is working. And Leora, who has been charged for all the publishing books, she knows it. And in, when they accepted the poems, something is, is happening. We both don't understand it. I don't even feel it because <laughs> I have no feeling with English. But uh, but people are reject are 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 are, are um. Uh, showing us all the time that we as a couple, let's say, for the poems are working in English very well and we don't both understand. I don't think that Lisa understands what's happening here. <laughs> and, but I have experience with many other translators and people say, somebody says uh, to me with other translators that I feel that there is something beyond it. So, as one professor here in Germany, I feel that there is much beyond it, but it's not really transferred via this translation while with lisa nobody says it ever to any poem although she made mistakes and she knows it i have to correct her yeah i make mistakes for sure and you you yourself adriana corrected her with your critique in the past you don't i don't think that that's I, that's not how i would describe <laughs> what i did um i, I but, but these mistakes are are, are 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 matching the poem I, I'm correcting her just because it's something from the Sidhu or from the Bible she doesn't know. But it's working. That, that's a miracle. But all the things, we are talking about miracles here, what we are talking about, about poems. Poems are not really a machine. So you cannot talk about it with the regular logic that we are... Something is happening here. Maybe you as a researcher of poetry can understand it better than us, but we don't understand, so it's not the right thing to ask Lisa. Um, I think, Lisa, you, I, I'm not trying to pin you down not to describe your why you make certain choices or others, but um, I do think this whole notion, again, going by the expectations we often have to deal with as translators, that people expect us to be experts on the text that we're um, translating, I just wanted you to reflect, especially because you did mention these poems in particular, um, if there was something, because you said you were hoping that someone else could explain it to you, um, but I think you raise an important point that it's possible to translate um, without having all the answers in front of you. Um, but is that the case for every poem, or what was it about these this particular series of poems that you felt sure because... you didn't have all all the answers for. You should understand that some of these poems were translated 20 years ago. I just didn't put them in the first book because I had some idea that I didn't, I wasn't sure they were right and finished or I didn't understand them or I thought they weren't as interesting. So, so, so I don't even remember, but I just want to say everybody knows Emily Dickinson, right? You read Emily Dickinson, what on earth does she mean? I don't know. So you take the soldier and the stone and the what and you translate the words and 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 in hebrew I, I because i'm so lucky to have english with its incredible vocabulary i'm very happy that i don't have to read emily dickinson in in hebrew and every, but everybody i understand why people want to do it and then of course it's completely different but i don't know like what does emily dickinson mean i don't know and it depends when you read it you know um when does any really good poetry? That's why I, I maybe this sounds um, um, pretentious, but I think this is really good poetry. Therefore, it's really interesting and you don't get it all. Anyway, all poetry that I really like doesn't tell me what to think and doesn't give me a lecture. It's, it evokes things. And then I, as the reader, put them together. Um, so I think uh, we, we have time for one more question. And I wanted to ask you a bit about um, translating Jewish intertextuality. 
um, which is something I think we've, Tamar brought this up, and I think this is one of the um, hallmarks of Edmiel's poetry. Usually, I think the question we get a lot as translators of Hebrew poetry is how do we handle sort of biblical references and that sort of thing. But I think with Kosma's poetry, it goes even more than that. It's also that there are a lot of references to the Talmud, to sort of this rich um, multilingual tradition of Jewish exegesis um, or interpretation. Um, and then, so that can present sort of other challenges for a translator because sometimes these texts don't have say a King James translation <laughs> that has been widely circulating um, that we can um, go to. So when you're translating texts that are kind of heavily, I know first of all that that you're very transparent about, um, you know, just that there are references that evade you um, and that you're sometimes relying on Admiel or other readers to kind of, yes, to, to kind of help you identify certain moments in these poems. But then when it comes down to like kind of the, the nitty gritty of translating, um, sort of I'm curious a bit about your process of deciding kind of what stays and what goes in terms of making these intertextual moments sort of more explicit for a non-Hebrew reader. And I, actually the only example I can give you has to do with an Aggie Michelle poem that she wrote a million years ago that has Gimel from the army in it. A Gimel is a, you can stay home and stay in bed when you're in the army. And somebody has, a Yom Gimel is a Tuesday and someone has translated it as Tuesday and I had to translate it as a day off from the army, which is a whole sentence. Um, but there I thought it would be completely, the person would, reading the poem would know nothing, understand nothing. So that was her Jewish text in a sense, this gimel from the army. Um, with Admiel, he either sends me stuff or I, you know, thank God for the internet. I, I think I have one explanation of something that I didn't understand until I read online in Hebrew or something, because I can read Hebrew, so sometimes I can look. But usually I depend on Admiel to explain as best he can. And then I guess I, I don't really remember. Each poem is different. I, I decide whether I'm going to explain it or I'm going to leave it out. Probably the best thing if we could, some publisher would be willing is to have a, you know, like a big anthology in chronological order with notes. So people who wanted to know could know. I think that wraps, I wraps think up you, our section. <laughs> hey, thank you to you both. So we do have a couple of minutes if anyone has questions they want to put in the Zoom. Um, there's been so many interesting observations about the act of writing poetry and translating poetry and consuming poetry. Um, maybe I'll just uh, share two quotes that popped into my head. One related to what uh, Adriana was just saying, uh, Franz Rosenzweig, who did translate a lot of Hebrew um, and also interesting in, his, in the religious but not religious and interesting uh, um, vantage point there. Um, said that all, all of Hebrew literature is in quotation marks, uh, which is, I think, one of the challenges that Adriana and Lisa were just uh, discussing. You know, if everything's in quotation marks, you know, is there anything other than a Norton anthology with all those notes that can really do justice? And yet, I think, you know, it was really a beautiful insight that, you know, it, it, uh, it actually takes away from that. So knowing something seems necessary, but knowing too much weighs it down. I think that's quite a quite a fascinating uh, and insightful way that you've, uh, you've put it, uh, the two of you. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, I mean, I kept, I kept thinking as you were talking, Leonard Cohen always says that he didn't, he didn't write his songs. He just went to some place where the songs were and they came to him. And if he knew how to get there, he would go there more often because he actually made a lot of money on his songs. So for him, you know, he wanted access to this place of songs that uh, just, you know, the songs were, and then they would come through him onto the page and onto the stage. Um, so I, I I confess, you know, maybe I've just never been there. I, I don't actually understand this. I would love to, I'd love to understand that more or, or watch you, um, you know, as a poem comes to you. It sounds like a fascinating, uh, fascinating experience. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we had you just want, one you want me to say, you want me to to say something about it? If, it, it, if, if you could say it briefly, I would love to hear it briefly, yes. Yeah. Here again, uh, my great teacher, Buber, uh, I never go to any place. I never, I, I don't like even to travel. Uh, I just doing my jobs in life, you know, you have a lot of responsibilities, students, family. I have a Down syndrome daughter that I'm caring for all the time. 
um, I mean, life is full of duties and, and responsibilities, but for me, that's the synagogue, because this is the way you worship God. We are the people, we are the creatures that God has created. It doesn't matter if it's people or nature or whatever you meet. So I don't have to go anywhere. And it comes to me usually when I don't have time for the poem. The only thing that I have to do is to push something and to call somebody and apologize that I cannot come to the meeting 10 minutes after that I'm there. But the 10 minutes is the time that God wants me to write the poem. I'm, as I said, uh, this is my duty. So, But this is always pushing something. I'm, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of discussion with somebody or something. It happened to me that I wrote a poem on Kvish Gea. If you know in Israel, I don't know how to compare it to United States or New York. It's the main road in Israel. On driving, I wrote it somewhere. I don't know. Don't tell the police. But it came at that moment. So it never comes on time. That's what I can tell you. This is the only thing, not going to anywhere, any island or any place to get it. Life are the place of God. This is the way. There is no other place, no synagogue, no yeshiva, nowhere, no church. The only place to worship God is via the creatures on earth. When you serve the people, you serve God. And on the way, I'm, I have also pizza here and pizza there that I'm have to deliver and that takes 10 moments or even less sometimes amazing okay well on that uh quasi mystical note we'll have to wrap this up uh it's really been fascinating I, i've learned so much from all four of you thank you so much for your work and your conversation here um i do have to oh no i want to invite you next everyone next monday march 4th um the oxford interfaith forum will be hosting Professor Lawrence Schiffman, who is the uh, has a, quite the title. He's a Global Distinguished Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University. Um, and he will be speaking on the Dead Sea Scrolls and Jewish-Christian Dialogue, which is a topic that he's been thinking about and writing about for many decades. A marvelous speaker, for those of you who know him or have not yet had a ch chance to know him. So that will be next Monday at the regular 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Uh, England Time. And sorted other time zones around the world. Thank you all again very much. It was really such a fascinating pair of conversations and uh, I love the mixing of the conversations as well. Thank you all for being here and um, have a marvelous week. Just Thanks. one thank you thank for you. Kea who arranged all this event from Oxford University and she is yeah. hiding herself somewhere here and Leora who initiated this book in Leora Cycling who is with us here so I th thank you to you all that joined us and, and, and especially Adriana and Tamar. Thank you very much. And you are on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Shalom to everyone. Bye.